uh, a great business school professor. Uh, I'm sure he's an excellent teacher. Um, and uh, I'm really excited that he's here to talk about his, uh, his new work with us. Uh, thank thank you. you so much. Um, first of all, let me just say, uh, please feel free to ask any questions. I think it'd be more interesting to kind of have live, live Q&A at any point. Uh, but I really appreciate that, that introduction, John, especially because uh, you know, one way to, to motivate this project, which is joint with uh, Jonathan Davis and Pablo Montañez uh, and, uh, and Patrick Prakowski, <clears throat> uh, is by connecting it to sort of the, the platform and gigaf gigification uh, of work. Uh, so I presume at the MIT IDE lunch, everybody uh, knows about these, this phenomena and this uh, set of research around it. <clears throat> but what you might be less familiar with is uh, the way that regular jobs have also been uh, gigified over this uh, same period of time. So what you're looking at here is, uh, is an instance of uh, software called Gloat. Uh, um, and uh, uh, several... tasks or post-job uh, openings, and people from within the company can apply for this or sign up, uh, both for sort of gig work inside the firm, but also for, uh, for full-time jobs, or there's some companies that actually make jobs uh, more rotating so that, you know, you're only in your position for, say, three months to nine months, and then you use a marketplace like this uh, to, to find your next job, okay? <clears throat> uh, so, uh, these these in so-called internal talent marketplaces, uh, there's a software sector that now supports this, that has raised a lot of venture capital money. Uh, the big consulting firms uh, advocate for this and, you know, partner on it for implementation. And then you know, they have right, clients right. from around the Fortune 500 uh, companies uh, and there are several programs <coughs> in a lot of the uh, big uh, government bureaucracies um, uh, inside the U.S. Um, <clears throat> now, why is this sort of thing happening? Well, uh, I think some of the reasons are in David Deming's work, you know, have the idea that information technology is, shifts jobs towards a greater rotation, <laughs> greater uh, multitasking. <clears throat> and then also the idea that, you know, IT is going to lead organizations to care about adaptive responses. <clears throat> Uh, so you can think of these internal uh, talent marketplaces as being like coordination mechanisms for the rotation and for the uh, adaptive response. Okay? <clears throat> so these uh, markets, I think, uh, are, are similar to public facing markets uh, or other applications in market design. They're, they're structured like two sided markets, the two sides are the workers and the managers uh, of the teams or the different tasks. And the sense in which they're, they're like markets is the decision authority for who works on what resides in the nodes. It's the, uh, the line managers and the workers themselves that are self-selecting uh, into, uh, into the different uh, you know, jobs. Uh, but I think there are some also some big differences between uh, these sorts of internal markets and the normal uh, you know, platforms and, and market design ourselves. And the, the key way they're different is that uh, th there are organizational problems. There are, uh, in particular, principal agent problems, uh, I think, that, that appear in these internal labor markets that don't appear necessarily in, in the external. Okay? <clears throat> What's the idea? Well, inside the firm, you have a CEO or a, a principal uh, or, or a board chair with preferences over what the agents do, <clears throat> and they're constrained by workforce preferences if you just tell everyone what to do, they might quit or be, be demotivated. Um, <clears throat> uh, but they're not trying to maximize the agent's preferences. And this is a little bit different than a, a public facing market where part of the main uh, goal is to you know, make the underlying agents uh, happy, okay? <clears throat> but should we think of like prices as off the table? Like this is, they're not kind of proposing prices for this particular task, it's purely just like all within internal to the firm at your existing salary but matching. Yeah. Okay. So for the uh, applications today, there will be no prices. Uh, and that's common because a lot of the firms on that slide over there uh, were government firms with, with unions that, that you know, don't want to give anyone a raise without some sort of thing. Uh, and actually, that's even happening in companies like Google as well. They just want to take price off the table. Now, I do think that informally, there are some companies that say, hey, you know, John, if you take this committee assignments that you're a good match for, that maybe I'm not, uh, we'll give you a little bonus somewhere. 
Um, and in the optimal mechanism uh, project, which is, you know, uh, not, not being presented today, that's on the table, absolutely. Yes. <clears throat> Assuming prices are stable, uh -huh. um, does this, by either removing some worker protections or otherwise, does it destabilize or make more fragile the relational contracts between the employer and the employee? Um, as opposed to the explicit contract? Probably so. That's a potentially negative aspect of these that, um, that we're not getting into in this paper, uh, even theoretically, but it is true that, uh, you know, that by moving people around, you don't have as strong as a relational contracts. Now, there are some other upsides to moving people around. Uh, in a lot of cases, the relational contract wasn't so uh, good. I don't know if you've seen the work on so-called talent hoarding. Uh, but uh, the people worried about this actually like this sort of gigification because if you're being talent hoarded, you can just leave. Uh, and actually one, one company, uh, which is Google, explicitly said, uh, we love this idea because all the bad managers will just endogenously lose their teams. <laughs> um, uh, but it's true, there could be those uh, negative side effects. Too. But so you're already hearing that we're, we have some agency and some coordination issues that come out of organizational economics uh, in addition to the market design issues that you would on a, a sort of normal platform, okay? So that's the general theme and topic we're exploring in this topic, in this talk, and then in some related papers I'll tell you about uh, as well, okay? <clears throat> uh, so uh, in this talk, I will be presenting a, a theory model of these internal markets uh, versus both normal management, uh, where you don't have a market and you more like just tell people uh, what to do, um, and in contrast to normal platform or market design, where there is no uh, uh, principle where they just uh, contract uh, on their own, essentially. Okay? <clears throat> and we'll be able to see what is being traded off, uh, what's the nature of the trade off, and, and uh, what this depends on. Okay? Uh, then I'll be looking at uh, presenting some in, in empirical evidence about the key parameters of this, this model uh, before. Uh, this is from a, a Fortune 500 company that has uh, an, uh, an internal talent market, but could also assign people in other ways. And uh, we will be able to look at some data about skill match measures of worker satisfaction and various um, other, other things that come out of the model. Okay. So that gives you a sense of where we're going. <clears throat> the key uh, trade-off theoretically that will be explored uh, yeah, th throughout the paper is this idea that... Uh, you know, the principal often wants to uh, coordinate assignments, okay? So there are reasons in, you know, the strategy literature or productivity literature about why you may want to uh, coordinate multiple business activities. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, uh, you know, there's also kind of obvious evidence that workers may need to be engaged in order for the firm to perform well, okay? <clears throat> and so these things could ultimately come in... Uh, uh, intention with each other, okay? So the, the, the boss would be happier if you had coordinated activities. Uh, incidentally, I've been giving a bunch of uh, motivation around productivity, but another very common form of coordination is the boss doesn't want segregation on the job, okay? So uh, sometimes when you leave it up to worker preferences, uh, homophily kicks in and all the men are in one division uh, and all the women are in other divisions. Uh, but this coordination means, you know, someone has to do something that they don't want. Maybe you have to uh, work for a man when you didn't want to or work for a woman if you didn't want to. Okay, that'd be an example. Uh, or you might have to uh, work on something you know how to do well, but you were sort of hoping uh, to quote unquote grow, uh, which, you know, that's another margin where you actually see trade-offs uh, in this data. <clears throat> so this coordination uh, motivation uh, trade-off is, is what uh, the internal mechanisms are, are having to navigate. Okay? <clears throat> uh, so uh, let me give you a preview of, uh, of a couple of empirical results to give, show you where you're going. Yes. Oh, wait, so okay. okay. All right. Great. <clears throat> First thing, uh, at least according to the executives, um, dictating matches is just much more productive. Okay? <clears throat> um, uh, specifically, it's about 36% higher compared to just random, random ways of people. Now, we will probably spend some time talking about whether the, the executives value the right matches, can't really take a stand on, on, on whether, you know, that they were right, okay? Uh, but according to their preferred for performance metric, um, uh, specified ex-ante, 
uh, it's 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 more uh, more productive uh, by a lot to to just dictate. Okay, compared to other interventions, like you would have to fire about seventy five percent of the workforce and replace them with workers who are at the top twenty five percent to get this thirty five percent increase. So it's like a large compared to other uh, interventions. Sorry, yes. what is what is random? Is random like just sort jobs to openings of people to openings totally randomly, or is Correct. it like workers have more say over which openings they move to? Random is the first thing you random said. Is random. Okay. Yeah. Now we're talking about the workers' preferences. Okay. So it turns out they don't really want uh, their their firm dictated match. Okay. Um, even when they're yeah yeah so so um, and it's not uh, just that they don't uh, like being told, but the actual you know their their preferences I think are. Are quite different from this. <clears throat> um, and they also don't seem to want to maximize their individual productivity. Uh, maximizing their individual productivity is, of course, not the same as doing what the firm wants overall, but they, they don't even want to do this. Um, <clears throat> and it looks like dictating is about as desirable uh, to workers and managers as a random draw. Okay, so that's how uncorrelated uh, these, these preferences are. Okay. Specifically, that would mean that about 90% of workers are in a tight for, for last place uh, spot. Yes? Can, uh, can I ask in what kind of time frame I should look at this? Because I can imagine maybe there is some initial match which is like highly productive, but then of course over time either because learning is really important or because people would just quit because they don't like their task mm -hmm. as much. Yeah. So. People are rotating about once every one and a half years. Okay, okay. So that's, still, that's still considerable. Awesome. So, <clears throat> oops. Uh, so uh, they, they seem to be wanting different things in the firm. The, the executives actually think they're much better off uh, dictating. Yes. How do we reconcile this finding of higher productivity with workers not wanting to maximize their individual productivity? Uh, coming very shortly. So, uh, so uh, hang tight. It'll be very, very short. Okay. All right. Now, when we contrast this, you might think, well, surely the workers want some level of productivity. Yes, but to the tune of about 3% better than random, uh, as opposed to the 36%. Okay? Um, <clears throat> now, of course, they, they like their job uh, much, much better. 25% okay? uh, of them are now in the tide for last place. Um, and the percentile rank of their match partner, partner you know, increases uh, about 40%. Okay? So big improvements on how they rank uh, uh, their matches. Okay? <clears throat> So now to, to, I think, Muhammad's question, is that right? Uh, why is this? Uh, so I'll present two reasons, okay, uh, co coming out of the data. The first one is around assortative matching. Essentially, the workforce generates a, a, a relatively assortative match where the best workers and the best managers uh, want to be together. We can speculate about why. Not too hard, I don't think. Uh, but, but they team up uh, and form, I mean, the exaggerated version of this is like super teams. Uh, super teams within the firm, um, and the, the, the executives would actually prefer to spread talent out a little bit more, and we can uh, estimate the, productive, uh, the production function. Uh, the execs believe there's a submodular production function uh, where there are declining returns to talent. Your first superstar pays off a lot, the second one doesn't, um, and this is part of why they want to uh, uh, spread things out. One, one big reason why there's this uh, difference, okay? Uh, the second thing is that the workers uh, want on-the-job training, uh, and they can actually uh, label in their internal profiles what they are seeking on-the-job training for, <clears throat> and that's how we have data about it. And in their rankings, we can see uh, that, that, you know, they, that they value this uh, training. <clears throat> Um, so uh, it's a classic labor economics result that firms do not want to... <laughs> Uh, facilitate to, to provide training, uh, particularly for uh, non-firm specific stuff because of the poaching externality. Uh, you know, I train you up on things that the whole industry wants and you just, uh, you know, get poached by someone else, okay? Uh, when we categorize the stuff they want to grow on, 90% is stuff that their competitors would want them to know how to do too, okay? I, even though there's plenty of firm specific things that they could grow, but that's not how they want to grow. And, so we, uh, <clears throat> we have this uh, other source of tension between uh, executives and firms' preferences uh, being driven by this uh, on-the-job training growth uh, in poaching externalities. 
All right. Um, <clears throat> now, a couple of other smaller things. If, you, if they had maximized their own match quality, they still would have gotten some uh, uh, benefits. And you can already see why would they not want to maximize their own match quality? Well, if they want to grow, that may actually involve uh, a, a ramp up, I think is the nice way to put it. <laughs> uh, not being good in the, in the very beginning. <clears throat> Uh, they would have to internalize externalities uh, in order to hit the full uh, 36 percent, uh, but it looks, I mean, we find no evidence that they uh, uh, had a coordination failure around these, uh, these externalities. What's a coordination failure? Well, suppose that John could teach and do research. He was actually better at research, but he's a pretty awesome teacher. Meanwhile, I'm not as good as research as John, but it's the only thing I could do. Well, to maximize the, the overall productivity, uh, maybe we put John in teaching and me in research, even though I'm kind of second best at it because, uh, you know, because of comparative advantage sort of things. Uh, that is not what's going on. Maybe you're surprised by that, maybe you're not. <laughs> uh, but, but I think that we can uh, you know, clearly see this. <clears throat> uh, so uh, this is related to several strands of literature, but I'm just, uh, calling out the most relevant ones um, and need not even very completely here. Uh, some platforms and market design matching sort of stuff, but then also some coordination and delegation. And you can actually think of the, uh, the platform as being a form of delegation where you say, not going to kind of sort of let the agents decide themselves, but here with a relatively complicated uh, matching structure um, uh, on the delegation side. And you know, related to uh, happy workers being more productive, uh, possibly as well. <clears throat> um, so, with my remaining time, I'll just give you a sketch of the model, and then spend most of the time on on the uh, on the um, uh, empirical results. Um, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Oops, but otherwise, I could just jump in. It seems like everybody's already asked their questions. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I want to set this up partly uh, so that you can. Imagine how an optimal model would work, uh, but in this paper, we're only looking at uh, kind of normal management of just command and control uh, versus uh, using the market. Okay? But suppose we have an organization with a single principal uh, and then agents who are workers uh, and managers. <coughs> uh, and we're looking at a balance set, but, but um, you know, most of this would generalize if you had more workers than managers or something like this. So every worker needs to be assigned, um, and there are uh, you know, lots of different ways to assign uh, all of the workers together. <clears throat> and then we have this, uh, this figure that uh, you know, doesn't appear in that many uh, market design papers, which is the principal's value. This is sort of the, the government of the organization's value for matching a particular worker. And uh, the CEO's goal, I'm just kind of going over this quickly, is to try to choose a matching of all workers uh, that would maximize the sum of these things. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so there are some elements of coordination there, oops, uh, kind of along the lines of what uh, you know, the, the thought experiment with John and I research and teaching. <laughs> Uh, you know, with comparative advantage and things like this. And there's a spillover cost to having John, for example, do what he does best if that's researching, uh, because then he's blocking uh, other people from doing that who may not have any kind of thing that they do uh, second best. <clears throat> All right, so uh, absent, uh, absent preferences, this is a pretty easy uh, problem, uh, but now we'll introduce some preferences which will constrain. If you make the workers too unhappy, they could uh, just quit. Um, yes. Are we thinking of those VAGs as being independent of like worker and manager preferences, or are they a function of those plus profit? Um, I will show you the assumptions around that just a second, but I'll uh, look at this from a couple of angles regarding uh, that question. Okay? Um, but now we're uh, introducing these cardinal preferences, uh, and we're just going to say everyone has an outside option. Uh, they can quit if this is not met. You could <clears throat> probably generalize this fairly easily by saying, People slack off by X percent uh, if they, uh, if if their preferences are not met. Um, but uh, that I think the the basic qualitative results I think would, would probably uh, be the same. Okay? <clears throat> um, so now to Hong Yi's question: What assumptions are we making about uh, the relationship between preferences um, and um, uh, and actual firm, firm productivity? <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, we'll go through uh, three of these really quick. I do want to say that it seems like the first one matches the data uh, uh, best of all. That is, there's uh, essentially no, um, you know, no correlation between what the workers um, and the managers are trying to do. Okay, um, <clears throat> but we'll look at random preferences, caring about the the productivity of the firm as a whole, uh, or caring about their own productivities only, and then uh, assess uh, markets versus management uh, in both senses. <clears throat> All right, so starting with the, the random preferences, uh, I'll just tell you the theoretical results. Essentially, the CEO will want to just assign people if there's enough match-specific productivity. Uh, if the workers' outside options are relatively weak, there's really no threat of, of them leaving anyway. And then also if their match specific preferences are pretty weak, okay? If the workers say, I don't really care which, you know, which thing I'm gonna be, be going on, <clears throat> uh, uh, then the, the CEO will essentially pay no retention cost for, for doing whatever uh, he wants. Okay? Um, <clears throat> now on, on the flip side of this, uh, if you have low match specific productivity, essentially all the workers are generalists, then you pay no cost from just letting them do whatever they wanna do, okay? In fact, it's beneficial because you get happy workers being more productive, but without you know, match specific uh, productivity penalties because there's no match specific productivity in this kind of worker generalist uh, sort of role, okay? Now, an important caveat I think to all of this is that, uh, you, you know, we're assuming that the CEO actually knows what's most productive and um, you know, uh, you know, can command people to do productive things, uh, but they might not. And it's not too hard to show that theoretically if you know, the CEO observes productivity with noise then the benefits of command and control uh, are gonna go down. Okay? Uh, in the um, uh, empirical section, we'll be able to uh, show something about how noisy do CEO beliefs have to be until, you know, you may as well just let people uh, pick their own jobs because uh, there's, you know, there's n even if there is match specific productivity, if the CEO doesn't know that, you can't really harness it. Okay. <clears throat> yes. So when you say the command and control, mm -hmm. that ignores the outside option. Like it's, it's, it basically may match somebody with an outside option that will make that person quit. Yes. As opposed to doing a maximum matching where that edge would have value zero because that person would quit. Um, so <clears throat> here uh, the, the, in this command and control, the CEO, it's private information what the preferences are. Okay. okay. And so they, um, uh, part of what the market is gonna do is reveal something about preferences. Uh, so it's not that the key CEO doesn't know you're going to quit. Uh, or doesn't care that you're going to quit. It's just that they don't know, uh, and you need some strategy-proof, incentive-compatible type of mechanism to to reveal it. Uh, but I think we're on the same page, right? All right, great. <clears throat> All right. So second model, and then I'm going through this uh, pretty fast. Is now suppose that uh, the CEO and workers are perfectly aligned in the sense that you know when the firm does better, the workers do better. I think this is really hard to actually implement in practice with profit sharing or even just with a culture of highly motivated people or something like this. Uh, but what we can show is that the, the, the market is still not necessarily better than a command and control. Um, and this comes up for two reasons. Uh, first of all, you have interdependent values where the value of me teaching depends on what John is going to do. Um, and that produces multiple equilibrium. Um, and so, so then you, you have the possibility of arriving at a, at a bad equilibrium um, <clears throat> where you actually still would like some sort of principle uh, to perform a coordination task by setting the, uh, help, helping guide people to the most productive uh, um, uh, equilibrium. Okay? Now, it, it, just as an example of this, it could be the case that, uh, you know, I think John's gonna do the wrong thing. And so then it makes sense for me to do the wrong thing. Uh, you, could, you could get into one of these spirals based on beliefs that are almost like bank runs where um, you know, the beliefs about what other people are doing are pushing the, you know, the firm to a, a, a bad equal. All right, the, the second uh, thing is that even if they somehow avoid multiple equilibria and arrive at the best uh, outcome that 
you could just have someone dictate to the same thing. And there's no big penalty to this in the perfect alignment world because that's what the workers would want anyway. Um, they, you know, in this world, they have very little private information or, 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 or I mean, you need, you need the workers to have separate sources of utility, I think, to make this interesting uh, at all. Uh, otherwise, they're happy just being drones and doing whatever the CEO tells, tells them because that's what's uh, best for the firm uh, overall. Okay. Uh, so this is model two. And then, then finally, the workers can care narrowly about their own productivity and not uh, anybody else's. Uh, and we can show this is also insufficient to maximize uh, the output uh, of the firm, even taking quitting uh, into account. <clears throat> Um, and uh, organizational externalities are going to be the, the story, and the displacement externalities are, are here, okay? Now, in my, my little uh, teaching and research story, suppose John was being paid based on uh, his own output to the, you know, not, not caring about how the organization uh, would, would want uh, to perform. Well, he'd prefer to do research in that case, okay, if that is what he is most productive uh, doing. Uh, but that would leave me without anything to do if we had only had one slot uh, for, for each. And so the firm would not you know, perform uh, optimally overall, even though everybody was being paid um, uh, based on uh, their individual um, uh, output. Okay? Uh, you can also think of talent hoarding as being related to this. Okay? All managers want to maximize their own team's performance and sort of hoard the best people. In some cases, it might make more sense uh, to send a worker, you know, to another team where they're actually more needed. Uh, but, you know, this caring about your own productivity doesn't create the, uh, you know, the opportunity for that. <clears throat> now, there are certain uh, production functions uh, where this would work out, uh, particularly if you have, uh, I guess, a super modular production function where super teams are the best thing, uh, then, then matching uh, you know, maximizing your productivity would mean matching up with whoever the best person on the other side is, okay? Um, so uh, this is possible now, at least in our empirical setting, we have an example where, you know, the executives think it's not super modular. Uh, they actually want to spread talent around and make sure that every single project meets its minimum uh, uh, benchmarks as opposed to having whatever uh, right-hand uh, upper tail of outcomes uh, might also be possible. Yes? Um, this is a static setting, or is this dynamic? Like, does is are there repeat times? Do you do because it's, it's a gig setting? Like, I could imagine that there would be some uh, like big frictions to changing teams that might make it be better for you to just stay on some team that you're already on because you've learned the data they use and how to deal with the manager, or whatever. Do you do you think about that in that sort of like dynamic setting? Uh, the theory model is not dynamic. Some of the dynamic issues can get folded into the present uh, um, yeah, in, in various ways, but, but not all of them. Um, the, the firm, which I'm about to go to next, they do stagger the, the, the rotations so that not everyone is going on the market at the same time. Uh, thus, there will be coworkers on the receiving end mm -hmm. so that you know, they can actually uh, you know, teach, teach the new people what to do. <laughs> Uh, and this sort of thing, but um, but yeah, I do think that's probably probably important. Um, in practice. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> should you adopt this or not? Uh, I think uh, you know the punchline uh, from a five thousand point view uh, foot view is uh, it depends on the particular microeconomics and strategy of the setting. Uh, it depends on particularly how much asymmetric information uh, is there. Like, is there a real risk of people quitting or most people, they, they know, generally speaking, who's happy doing uh, what jobs, okay? Uh, what's the production technology? Is it super modular or submodular? What, um, you know, all these various things, okay? Now, I don't think that uh, command and control or um, a deferred acceptance style internal market in this necessarily the best thing. Uh, so, and you know, I, uh, my uh, collaborators and I have started working on what would be the optimal mechanism here. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we can talk about that some other time. Uh, but um, if you're interested in this sort of thing, I'd love to, love to tell you about it. <clears throat> okay, so um, why don't we get into the, the empirical section now? 
so the empirical setting, uh, yeah, just, just let me know if you have any questions. This is going to be the sales engineering organization in uh, a, 500, a Fortune 500 company. They are creating software products for clients, um, and they have a, a flat wage individual bonus in stock. Um, you know, we're talking about people in their 20s and, and 30s. <clears throat> And I can give you whatever other detail uh, you're, you're interested in. I guess I wasn't sure how much uh, to, to put about this. Um, <clears throat> and um, the, the sample of our data starts with this new system to give workers more choice uh, through the deferred acceptance algorithm. Okay, I'll give you a sense of what this looks like. Um, on the worker side, there were people that wanted career growth, which, you know, you should now know there are, there are already going to be trade-offs right there because, uh, you know, that means people are going to need a ramp up period in their new jobs where they're not necessarily very qualified. <clears throat> um, and the manager sometimes wanted to cycle people out that had gotten demotivated or who were not a good skill fit with, um, you know, with, their, with their current position as the industries uh, evolved. <clears throat> so they, they had the deferred acceptance algorithm. Um, you know, participation was required. So uh, even if you didn't want to change jobs, well, at some point your term came up and you had to go back on the market. Uh, you could rematch with your own job and a good amount of people uh, actually did this. This deferred acceptance algorithm, in case you haven't seen this, is the medical residency match type of algorithm uh, where both sides rank each other and they, and they compute a stable match. Okay. And the key thing about this is that the, the principal has no input into this. Uh, you know, we actually had an executive say, oh, that's great. Um, you know, where do I put my preferences in? And the answer is, well, in deferred acceptance, you know, you basically, there's no place to, to uh, put, put in the, you know, the principal's one. Okay. Uh, the, we, we mocked this profile screen up because all of the actual screenshots had, you know, people's actual information in it. <laughs> Uh, but this is uh, akin to an internal LinkedIn like we saw on the opening slides. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, at regular intervals, you could look at the applicants to your position as well as the people who hadn't applied uh, and then rank them okay? uh, or the people who hadn't expressed uh, interest in someone. Okay? Uh, so you could rank them like this. Uh, you could also leave people in tied for last or even say, I would rather have an empty chair. <laughs> Uh, then have to work with so-and-so, or in the, the worker side, I'd rather quit than work on this particular project. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see, so, so we have about uh, uh, two and a half years of, uh, of data and can see some covariates about each worker and manager as well as their rankings uh, of each other through this deferred acceptance uh, system. <clears throat> um, and here's just some quick summary statistics. Uh, so uh, on average, people would, uh, would rank about 10% uh, uh, of their options and mostly leave the rest as, as tied for last. Um, uh, on average, uh, managers were on the market once and, uh, and workers were on you know, a little bit more than once. Okay. Um, cool. All right, now the, the key question in this sort of paper, yes, just um, in the ranking procedure. Uh -huh. <clears throat> if it's not the worker, not the, the agent, but the principal that's ranking, how do you avoid it? Ah, it's, um, so the two sides of the market, the two sets of agents are the, the, the line managers right. and the, the workers. Yes. So, and the principal is someone like an executive sort of sitting above this who has preferences of it. So it's, it's both, yeah, the, there's no role for the principal here except in a subtle way. I'll tell you that in one second. Go ahead. So, so the, the, the line manager. Uh -huh. I mean, they're, they're ranking, right? Because they're saying, yes, this person, yeah, potentially this person, not over my dead body, and this person, right? How do you, since they see the previous track record of that person and potentially a resume, how do you avoid introducing bias that stems from latent impressions from the previous, their previous assignments? I see. Yeah. Um, uh, there, uh, there may not, I mean, that, that's a potential other problem, I think, with deferred acceptance, um, uh, at least it, to this uh, application, is that they, they may just want to work with their friends, <laughs> or they may uh, have, have some other sort of bias. But, I, but yeah, I totally agree that 
uh, there may be something messed up about these assignments or, or these, these preferences, okay? Now, the same thing is true of the principles. There's no guarantee that the CEO is this enlightened person that like, you know, sees the diamonds in the rough or, or, or whatever. Um, but it's true on the worker side as well. They might think a manager is awful who is actually awesome for some bad reason. <clears throat> okay, so um, <clears throat> the, the key thing in this research design is what are the productive measures, okay? So let me tell you about how, how we did those. Uh, there are a, a series of papers that are similar to the design that we're doing, uh, where they estimate match-specific match productivity about doctors, uh, police officers, teach, uh, teachers, okay. and uh, generally what they're doing is that they have some uh, historical data about uh, output in an objective sense, uh, wherever this is possible, and because of the endogeneity of historical assignments, they're doing various clever things to recover a productive, you know, a productivity function using natural experiments that, that happened uh, in the past. Okay? So uh, we are doing essentially that same uh, research design. Okay? Uh, now, there is some, some good news uh, and some bad news. The good news is they figured this out themselves. And, and, and ran these research designs that essentially themselves, okay? Uh, so it's as if they did the methods kind of in this, uh, uh, this paper, okay? Using their own objective and subjective notions of what match quality is to, uh, to, to fit this uh, sort of model, okay? <clears throat> and the reason is they were worried about this exact problem that we've been talking about. What if the workers team up with their buddies and just start wasting the firm's time? <laughs> Uh, they're not actually qualified to do anything, uh, but they're just kind of wasting time. So they wanted to have this uh, notion of what their priorities were for evaluations to see if the market was going off the rails. And then they also implemented this nudge that was on the previous screen, okay? So the nudge uh, is in the form of these check marks or this uh, caution. This is basically saying, we, you know, we don't think Isaac is a good match. <laughs> Uh, caution about about doing this. Okay. Now uh, I will show you later, but it looks as though the workers ignored this. Uh, that is not causally identified, but it seems like their their preferences are uncorrelated with those uh, you know with those scores. You know? And insofar as they were, it, you know, they could have been even more uh, uncorrelated, absent these nudges. Okay. Yes. Was there really any explanation with the assignments of the nudges, or just like you get one of these three symbols and nothing else? There was some explanation. Uh, I don't know if they uh, read or understood it, but there was some explanation uh, saying uh, what the general objective of the nudges was, and then a little bit of detail uh, that w about what into it, what went into it, which which I'll show now. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, like I said, the, the good news is that they ran these methods. Uh, themselves, the, the bad news is they did it, not us, okay? Now, that's nice because it's their objectives. Like, they actually know what's important. But we can't exactly, we, we can't, we don't know that much about uh, what they, uh, you know, what they were optimizing for and exactly how they did it, okay? <clears throat> uh, we do know, however, uh, that the skill match gets a high weight. So there's a structured language inside the firm for skills and proficiency about this. And the, the level of skill match between what the worker historically did well and was would, and rated well, and uh, what the position needed was reported in the profile as needed, you know, that, that degree of match was being uh, weighted highly by you know, the algorithm that they fit and then modified and kind of uh, implemented for evaluation in, in this match. <clears throat> So you might wonder, well, is this like a crazy uh, algorithm or not? One thing we could look at is among the matches that actually happened, you know, something about how these were evaluated. Um, so in particular, were they assessed at performing or, or mastery specifically on the required skills for the job uh, and for the preferred skills? Uh, so here's what you can see uh, on this. <clears throat> 25, a, a one um, you know, a one standard deviation increase in the objective score, that's the thing behind the nudges, uh, you know, corresponds to a uh, 25 percentage point increase in the probability that they, uh, you know, that they're assessed as performing or mastery at a required, and then 28 for the preferred uh, things, okay? 
And this is relatively big in standard deviation uh, uh, units as well. Okay? So at the beginning of the talk, I said, you, you, know, you might wonder, are they paying attention to um, the right stuff? Uh, maybe this is some uh, get, you know, uh, evidence that they're paying attention to reasonable things. But I think it's always a question uh, you know, of like what truly is in the best interest um, <clears throat> of the firm in the long run, or even the firm's shareholders. Um, and I don't think we can definitively say that they're doing the right thing, but it, it, I think it appears to be uh, reasonable. All right, <clears throat> so uh, the general empirical strategy here is to uh, take the firm's preferred assignments. Of course, they, they had done this themselves. We're going to use this objective score uh, to find the match that would maximize the firm's objectives. Okay? Um, and you can do this with linear programming uh, uh, tools, the uh, previous papers that I cited before, uh, we're doing this as well. <clears throat> and then compare this to what actually happened uh, in the internal talent market and then other ways of assigning people uh, as well. <clears throat> so uh, there are, I think there are some downsides to this, um, uh, to this research design. The, the main one, I think, being that um, uh, you know, the, the execs may have implemented the, the quote unquote wrong objective function, uh, whatever that means. <laughs> uh, but an upside is you may have fewer omitted payoff problems. Uh, you know, if we, if we were trying to only look at the outcome of revenue, for example, well, then you could do things that are good in short-term revenue, but uh, ultimately are not that good <clears throat> uh, in the long run. Um, there's also some benefits that they're incentivized to, you know, to find an objective function that's good for them uh, because they're going to use it to evaluate this thing. Uh, and it's also good, I think, that they handled the implementation uh, guaranteeing that it wasn't we researcher degrees of freedom that kind of cooked this all up. Okay. <clears throat> but um, with that, oops, with that out of the way, let me tell you uh, now about some results on the core questions. Okay. Uh, first of all, like I said, there seem to be huge uh, gains for command and control. <clears throat> Um, and I already mentioned this is about the 36% um, uh, increase above random. Uh, random is out here and, um, uh, you know, is, is at 255, but the, you know, they can find something that's uh, further along because you know, when the firm is in control, it's going to be trying to find the very maximum uh, thing, not something close to it. Um, if you look at the average match quality, measured with the firm objective score. Um, you know, it's uh, 75, uh, and this is the units they had, which was between zero and one uh, for uh, command and control. And both versions of DA, essentially no matter, uh, they ran it as workers proposed, but you could also run it as <coughs> proposed, you know, gets significantly lower in terms of uh, the you know, firm estimated productivity, essentially. <coughs> Um, now, uh, on the job satisfaction, um, you know, we, we get similar results here. Uh, so uh, on, on average, if you just randomly assigned people, 90% uh, of workers would be in a tight for last place uh, situation. Uh, it's much, much less. It's like, I think around 25%. I mean, both, both of these two methods are going to be able to uh, capture extremes in this distribution, but just uh, extremes for different, uh, for, for different things. What, what is tied for last mean again? Uh, that means that you said that working with this match partner was better than quitting, um, but, 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 um, it's the it's the smallest above your reservation. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah exactly, <clears throat> exactly. Um, <clears throat> And like I said, this is about a 40 percentile increase in, uh, in, in the rank, okay? or, or how much you like, um, you know, how you rank the person that, that you're with. Okay? So there are a lot of people in deferred acceptance getting their number one, two, three, four, you know, sometimes five. Uh, here, people are getting a much further <clears throat> in their different rankings uh, when, when the firm is in charge. <clears throat> All right, so what are the preferences that generated these results? Um, I'm just going to go through this quickly to make sure that, that we have enough uh, time. <clears throat> you can uh, run a regression that try to, tries to look at 
you know, how an agent ranked the other side is a function of did the firm want you to be there? And also, uh, what was your personal level of productivity? Um, and this is kind of like the case two and three comparison we were looking at before. And this regression will say, well, how much does each, each agent in the firm care about the firm's overall success <coughs> as well as their <coughs> individual estimated productivity out here? Okay? <coughs> and so we get these results on the worker side. Uh, you can do this in a rank ordered logic version too, but it looks like they don't care about these things very much. <laughs> Um, and, um, <clears throat> you know, it's possible that, uh, um, uh, you know, the incentives of the firm, either at the individual or at the firm level, are just not strong enough for them to really care that much about this, as opposed to uh, other objectives like growing or of a, like, uh, you know, being on a uh, high profile project or working with a well known manager or something like this. <clears throat> Um, same thing uh, with, with, with the manager side. Um, <clears throat> uh, now, you, you might wonder, well, what would happen if workers tried to maximize uh, their, their own productivity, ignoring the, the benefits on everybody else? Well, we can run this simulation and see that you know, delegating improves by about 24% uh, in that world. Uh, but you need to internalize the externalities. Um, <clears throat> in order to get all the way to the, the 36%. We can try to measure <clears throat> whether uh, there was a coordination failure. So I, I mentioned earlier that there's multiple equilibria. That, um, and um, you, know, you, can, you can try to measure whether or not they tried to do the right thing for the firm conditional on what other people were doing. And we essentially find no uh, evidence for this. And uh, the other major reason I think that, that, as I alluded to earlier, that there was this uh, difference is that <clears throat> lots of the workers uh, wanted growth uh, and, um, <clears throat> um, um, you know, the, the, uh, the executives would prefer to essentially not subsidize growth, but have people work immediately in jobs uh, where there was no ramp up uh, and, and that they were productive. Okay. <clears throat> We also see this result uh, uh, on uh, rel assortedness of diff different matching. I'm kind of hurrying uh, through this a little bit. Uh, but uh, what, what this, this slide generates is a, a measure of disassortative matching uh, as a function of the uh, average quality of uh, each worker and manager um, you know, assessed across lots of different potential matches. <clears throat> And the, uh, you know, the firm dictated match is a lot more negatively assortative. So the best worker is not working with the best manager. Actually, the, it's more likely that the best worker is working on the, the, the worst manager or the worst project, trying to drag them up as opposed to you know, having the complementarities of, uh, of two stars. Okay? <clears throat> now, here's an important uh, check, I think. Uh, I mentioned that if you observe, you know, if the principal observes the objectives noisily, you know, I mean, the principal might have no idea what the most productive matches are. Um, <clears throat> and it's easy to show theoretically that as there's more noise, the benefits of command and control start to go away because you may as well let, you know, let workers be happy if you actually don't know. Okay. Now, this directly speaks to the question uh, in our research design, which is that or you know, the firm may have fit the wrong regression or whatever uh, with regards to its estimate of max specific quality, okay? Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, uh, looked at this question of how off would the objective score have to be uh, to destroy the results, okay? Uh, specifically the result that the, the dictated match was gonna be more uh, productive, okay? <clears throat> So what we've done uh, in this uh, last exercise is we're assuming that the, the firm objective tr uh, score is actually the truth plus some noise. Um, and you can think of this as being like, uh, you know, random IID noise uh, with some uh, variance. And we're going to add more and more noise. Uh, we'll start off with a correlation of one between the estimated objectives or productivities and this, uh, you know, and, and, and what, what the true ones are. And as you add more and more noise, these go all the way to a correlation 
uh, of zero, right? <clears throat> so having done that, we'll then rerun the entire exercise uh, and say, well, is it still true that uh, deferred except, you know, that, that command and control is generating what, what the executives would think ex post are, um, are better matches. Uh, so here are the results we get. <clears throat> um, and on the bottom here is, is so this is the correlation. You get noisier observations uh, as you go uh, this way. Um, and the, uh, this is around 0.3. This is the last one where you can reject the difference between command and control. You know, the command and control minus deferred acceptance is still uh, above zero. Okay? <clears throat> so of course, at some point, it just becomes indistinguishable because uh, deferred acceptance is as good as random for productivity. And if the principal is just viewing it with lots of noise, it's essentially random. <clears throat> so what this essentially means is uh, the um, the principal's observation doesn't have to be perfect for it to be better. In principle, this, this could have dropped off much more steeply, <clears throat> uh, at least for, for this exercise, as long as the principal's beliefs about what the most productive matches are, are correlated with the real ones at above 0 0.3, um, then command and control uh, is going to be better. Uh, so, so we can talk about 0 0.3 and how big or small that is, but uh, John has a question. Um, oh, can you, is there something about this empirical context that makes it kind of O-ringish? Like, like, why does the CEO believe that, like, is it something where, you know, if the maintenance department is falling down, you know, the other department can't, can't do their thing? Like, what, what, like could, could you speak to that? I mean, I know... Mm -hmm. something, sure. something about what is it about production here that causes them to, this di divergence? I personally, I don't think it's it's O-ringish, and that's just because my general knowledge of the setting is not that uh, there are super big interdependencies. Uh, I think it's more just that the skill match really is a thing, uh, and the uh, the firm prefers to max this out, and the workers don't. Um, and so then the question is, how well does the firm know the previous skills? Well, these are workers that have been around for a while that have performance evaluations that actually specifically talk about what skills they did well in the past and not. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so it, it has some sense of this. Um, and uh, the, the question, I guess, is just uh, how precisely do they have to know that before it becomes, uh, you know, it kind of becomes a move, okay? So, I want to talk about what you know what point three means, but but yes. <clears throat> Generally speaking, point three seems like a pretty low threshold, right? So your information as a principal doesn't need to be that superior in order mm -hmm. to be able to give better matches. But that then leads to the question: is there something about the information asymmetry that the principal has and the conditions under which that information asymmetry is achieved that is unique to this firm? Or is that fairly transferable to other settings, right? I mean, you talked about the, the job evaluations and that leads to that information asymmetry and mm -hmm. that leads to that easily passing the, the point 0.3 threshold. But how sensitive is I that see. point right. 0.3 to the actual mechanics of the institutional setting? Is, is there a way to even go about fig figuring that out other than doing this in many settings? Totally. Um, yeah, so, so a couple of things. First of all, uh, I don't think there's necessarily a science to it, but uh, my sense is that that's a pretty kind of low threshold as well. Uh, and, you know, if, it, if you needed to know the truth correlated at 90% that, that would be kind of high. But point three, like I'm willing to believe that. You know, they still have the fact that there are repeat observations about these people uh, does give me some confidence that that, that they could actually do this. Now, maybe in a labor force with a lot of turnover, uh, you wouldn't have those level of, uh, uh, you know, that, that level of uh, knowledge. Uh, you could possibly test or intervene to try to collect this information. You know, that, that, could, be, um, that could be useful too. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, so, yeah, is this gonna be different in, in different occasions? Uh, I, I think it does depend on how many repeat observations? I guess I will say that I, that uh, you know this is not like a 
Okay. Just a minute. It's an informal observation, but I do think that one reason that these are, uh, are popular applications in, in some settings is not that the CEO or the executives don't know who is productive and who's not. So they just figure, oh, I'll delegate it. Uh, but doing that and intervening actually requires work, <laughs> requires effort. You know, uh, you might actually have to tell someone no for something that they don't want. And it's kind of easier from an internal, um, you know, political economy and popularity perspective to just say, hey, not taking a stand on anything here. <laughs> you guys do what you want. Here's this marketplace. And if you're not happy, you know, you don't blame me because, you know, you could, you could pick whatever. Um, now, that should probably be accounted for in the uh, economics of the firm, too, in some way. <laughs> but it's not related to whether they know. It's just whether they have sort of the willpower to lead the firm <laughs> um, and, and other kind of things like that. But, <clears throat> but in any event, so, oh, I think we're just about out of time, so that, that's perfect. Um, <clears throat> we have a practitioner article about this, uh, in case you know anyone who you know, wants to try it or modifications uh, like this. Uh, some other work I'm interested in is what's the optimal mechanism, uh, because uh, as John pointed out in the very beginning, uh, no one's being paid here. <laughs> Uh, the paid extra for their extra productivity. But if you had some uh, two-sided mechanism where you could you know, uh, ask for people's cardinal utility for different things and then possibly pay them to offset their unhappiness for having to do something they don't want, plus some information rent, then you could get uh, something that's good for all sides uh, through these transfers. And it, it wouldn't necessarily be stable uh, in the classic pairwise stability sense. Uh, but I think the firms don't necessarily need I mean, the firms can stop people from swapping and contracting outside the mechanism, um, unlike in the medical residency match. Okay, um, so I th and, and and in addition, I think there's some similar issues that appear in some non-workforce settings. Uh, in lots of cases where you have matching with constraints, you can think of the constraints that some principal uh, wants being similar to these organizational objectives, and you could use uh, similar tools. Uh, like a different mechanism to, to try to internalize those uh, priorities and kind of uh, make the, the, the market participants care about them. <clears throat> but in any event, uh, so, uh, you know, in this paper, we were kind of theoretically analyzing uh, how to assign workers and how much to use a market uh, driven by workers' preferences versus uh, kind of just having CEOs or executives tell people what to do. Um, <clears throat> part of the model I didn't get to uh, suggests that uh, you know the, the use of this sort of market is likely to grow at a time and that just comes out of the David Deming sort of work talking about greater multitasking greater rotation and things like this all of this are sort of inputs into uh, more internal markets <clears throat> then of course uh, we have this empirical case study where there are seem to be pretty big trade-offs um, uh, that are robust to potential, potential mismeasurement by the, by the principal. And assortative matching and the desire for growth uh, kind of seem like the, the biggest things I drive. Okay. Well, I think I've gone a little bit past, but uh, thank you so much. And um, um, I will see you guys uh, later today, I guess. <laughs>